It is no secret that the people of France were instrumental in helping the colonists win the American Revolution against Great Britain. Not long after the American Revolution, France also went through its own revolution. However, in a very odd turn of events, what was supposed to be a revolution for freedom seemed to place France in a very precarious position with an emperor named Napoleon Bonaparte. Now the codes and laws that Napoleon set forth for France did in fact affect the colony of Louisiana and possibly still affects the state of Louisiana to this day. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very huge and wonderful thank you to all of our Patreons and producers. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to be talking about the Napoleonic Code and the Little Red Man of France. So this story today is brought to you by one of our community members, Lorraine. Lorraine suggested that I look into the Napoleonic Code. Now here in America, as most Americans know, every state has different laws. We have federal law and we also have different state laws. The United States is supposed to be a republic. Therefore, the power of the state is supposed to be stronger than the power of the federal government. Now what I did know is that Louisiana still carries a set of laws put forth by the Emperor Napoleon. Now many people have very mixed feelings about Napoleon. Some will tell you he was a good guy while others will tell you he was a bad guy. In my opinion, Napoleon Bonaparte was very much a part of the 1%. And as I was researching Napoleon and the Napoleonic Code, I ran across something very, very interesting. Something that borderlines folklore and legend, but also connects us back to another historical character from France that we know was very, very nefarious. And this is Catherine de Medici. Now down in the description box below, I will place the full playlist for all of the episodes we have done on the city of New Orleans. I will also place past episodes that we have done over the country of France, and in particular, the House of Bourbon. Because anything nefarious or dastardly in New Orleans can be traced back to the monarchy of France. Now just to clarify, because it does seem like that there are a few people who watch these videos that get a little bit confused about where these links are located, if you look underneath this video, right underneath, you shall see what we call a description box. Now most of the time you have to click on the down arrow if you're on the iPhone or an iPad. If you're on your laptop or a desktop watching this episode, usually a part of the description box will be seen and you'll have to click the show more to see the full description box. I always include the links that I tell you I am going to include. You just have to actually go to the description box to click the link to bring you to that past episode or video. It's super easy. Literally just look right underneath this video that you're watching now. Click on the down arrow and then you'll see I label each link as to which episode is which so you know which episode you're clicking on. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on August 15th of 1769 on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. Now Napoleon Bonaparte's family was of Italian descent, but a year before Napoleon was born, France had annexed Corsica as part of its country. Now, Napoleon was the second of eight children, and his family was considered a minor noble family. 
Napoleon attended school on mainland France, and he graduated from the French Military Academy in 1785. He soon became the second lieutenant in the artillery regiment of the French army. In 1789, the French Revolution began, and three years in, the monarchy was overthrown. However, during this time, Napoleon was on leave and in Corsica. While he was on leave in his home island of Corsica, he got involved in some other groups, religious groups that have a very interesting backstory, to say the least. Some of these groups that start with a J, I can't actually say on YouTube because, you know. In 1793, the Bonaparte family had to actually flee Corsica. The history books will tell you that they had some issues with the governor and the way the island was being governed. However, with details like this, I don't know if we'll know the full story or the full truth until we know the full story and the full truth. Part of me thinks that this story about issues with the governor was more or less a cover story to get the Bonaparte family onto mainland France so Napoleon could be groomed for the military position he was about to take on. After all, the people of France, the heart and the soul of France, were tired of the way France had been ruled by the monarchy. Exact same thing that had happened in the American colonies, where the colonists themselves were sick and tired of the way they were being ruled by the English monarchy. Now, for those of you who have been on this journey for a very long time, you know that the monarchy of France was at this point the House of Bourbon. And even though all the monarchies all over Europe are intermarried and interrelated, we know that the House of Bourbon in particular holds a special place in our society today. It was their descendants that allegedly sit today on the top of this. Now at this point, Napoleon did return back to active military. Now, over the next few minutes, we're going to go over a brief timeline of what brought Napoleon as being a part of the military to actually being the emperor after the people had tried to revolt against the monarchy. Okay, so from 1793 to 1794, we had a year of what we now call the Reign of Terror. Anybody who knows anything about the French Revolution knows what I'm talking about. I'm going to have to be pretty guarded on what I say again because of this platform. But basically at this point, the people who had helped build the French Revolution started to kind of turn on each other in a very paranoid way. Anybody that they suspected to be resisting the revolution was basically literally with the machine that you know does that to people that France is is famous for. Now this is gonna <laughs> play into our modern times too which I will get Now, after this year of just chaos, the two brothers who were in charge of leading this chaos were themselves. Now, the thing about this is that Napoleon had gotten close to these two brothers. And because of this, Napoleon was basically put on house arrest for a little while so that they could keep their eyes on Napoleon. However, in 1795, Napoleon appears to have redeemed himself. It seems that there was an uprising, a group of people who were loyal to the monarch. They were royalist, and they were planning their own type of like resistance to the people who were pushing back against the monarch. And Napoleon, it seems, was the one to kind of squash that. This act basically showed the people that he was, you know, on their side. 
Napoleon to this day is famous for his military might. Some people are just really good at strategically placing themselves in battle. And during this time, France was bucking up against neighboring countries. Now when I say this, again, I don't mean the people. We now know that the people of each country are beautiful. They're the heart and soul of each country. I'm talking about the powers that be. And in my opinion, the what happened in the French Revolution was not what the people really intended to happen. But nonetheless, Napoleon was at this point gaining fame and popularity. After the monarch of France was technically removed from government, they created a group called the Directory. These were five men who basically governed France. And in 1798, the Directory wanted Napoleon to invade England. Now, it's no secret that England and France have always kind of been at each other's throats. It's like two siblings that can't seem to kind of get their shit together. But at this point, Napoleon actually declined this invitation to invade because he knew that England had a superior navy. But he said he had a better idea. Instead of going up north towards England, they were going to go south to Egypt. He was going to take the French military and try to cut off the trade routes that England had been using into Egypt. Now this is important and I hope that one day when more resources are available we can actually see what happened in Egypt during this time because it is during this time that many people believe particular artifacts and maybe some books that are important for humanity were removed from Egypt and solely held by the elite powers that be. In 1799, Napoleon thought it would be a really good idea to push back against the Ottoman Empire. If you caught our video last Friday, you know we spoke about the Ottoman Empire because that also ties into one particular story from New Orleans. Again, the New Orleans playlist will be down in the description box below if you missed that episode. But then, like a spoiled child, all of a sudden Napoleon felt like he was done playing with Egypt and playing with the Ottoman Empire, so he took his toys and he went home. And in November of 1799, Napoleon decided that he was going to overthrow the Directory. These five men that had been ruling France since they had eliminated the monarchy. He replaced the Directory with a three-person consulate, making him, himself, the first consulate. In 1802, Napoleon actually did an amendment to the French Constitution saying that he would be ruler for the rest of his life. And then in 1804, he crowned himself emperor at Notre Dame Cathedral. But something else happened in 1804, and this was when the Napoleonic Code was finalized. Now, it took four years for them to finalize this new set of laws. And with that being said, the Louisiana Purchase happened in 1803, where Napoleon sold the territory of Louisiana to the new United States government. Now, it would take a few more years before Louisiana would officially become a state in the Union. However, even though the Napoleonic Code wasn't finalized in France until 1804, Louisiana had already been given their version of the Napoleonic Code by the time the Louisiana Purchase went through. In Louisiana, this was called the Civil Code. The Napoleonic Code included things like the reinstatement of slavery. It reformed banks and education, but we now know that banks and education go hand in hand. And if it's being governed by certain people, then it's probably not, possibly not in the best interest of, you know, us. And it centralized the government. It also worked in some um, individual rights and uh, property rights. And this is the thing, again, that's very, very different with the United States Constitution. It says that you already have 
certain inalienable rights given to you by your creator that the government cannot impede on. But with other constitutions and other governmental laws, especially in the Napoleonic Code, the government is the one telling you what your rights are as an individual. This also included things like property. The Napoleonic Code took a huge step back when it came to women's rights, if there were any women's rights to begin with. Now this is interesting because we do know in New Orleans, if you remember back to our Delphine LaLaurie episode, women did have some rights. They had the rights to own their own property. They had the rights to inherit their own wealth, meaning wealth didn't necessarily have to be passed along to their husbands. But again, the Napoleonic Code kind of took this a step back. Women had zero rights under the Napoleonic Code. Men had all the rights. It also established stuff like you could not participate in governmental affairs unless you had a certain level of education, or aka indoctrination. The Napoleonic Code also reduced rights of illegitimate children. Now we did see this in the Delphine LaLaurie episode where she did have a child out of wedlock with her third husband and in their marriage contract they wanted to make sure that their child, their son, would be treated the same as his half-brothers and sisters who were born into wedlock, meaning that the state would allow him to equally inherit. But under the Napoleonic Code, this might not have been true anymore. Now, for those living in Louisiana, you know that Louisiana calls their, what we call in the rest of the states, counties, they call them parishes. Again, this has a lot to do with the Napoleonic Code. Now, from what I can see, the greatest concern that I have regarding this code, again, is the idea that the government could give individuals their rights and not innately given rights by God. In preparing for this episode, I did listen to some lawyers from New Orleans talk about the differences in the states, especially with Louisiana's civil code from the Napoleonic Code. Some of the stuff just seems like basic mumbo jumbo having to do with the states when you pass away, who inherits, all that kind of stuff. Some of it does sound quite similar to other laws established in other states. However, I found something super interesting. There's obviously more to this story than meets the eyes because you can find many blogs of students of law who have gone through law school in Louisiana or taken the bar in Louisiana and then having to move state. And according to them, the laws are so different in Louisiana to like say Georgia where I am or Tennessee or Mississippi or Alabama or any other state that they literally are not prepared to even take the bar because it is just so freaking different. And for me, as far as that kind of law, that's not really my wheelhouse. So I would super be interested if any of you out there want to break this down or come on the channel to break it down even more, I would love to have you on there. Again, the biggest thing that I could see was the whole idea of the government government giving you rights, you know, versus when actuality could cause a lot of problems when we're dealing with what we've dealt with over these last couple of years. Now more stuff happened to Napoleon throughout the remainder of his life, but we're not going to focus on that quite yet. It is of my opinion that Napoleon was one of these people that, you know, you know who I'm talking about, into that dark stuff. And I believe that he was placed where he was placed by this group in order to basically run interference for the revolution that was happening in France to kind of steer the people back, right back into a more controlled environment. Napoleon passed away on the 5th of May of 1821. It's something super interesting. They like took his organs out and saved them and... They even cut his, like, man parts off, like, super weird, but, you know, they do their stuff, they do their little rituals, you, you know, I don't even know if I want to know what they were doing with his little man part, but there you go. Sometimes when doing this research, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by what is available. 
sometimes there is stuff that's not available and we just have to connect the dots on what we assume might have happened by the information that we have and knowing what we know now. Well, when I was looking into Napoleon's background to try to find more concrete proof that he was not the good guy maybe some people think he was, I found the legend of the Little Red Man of France. Now, a few months back, again, we did a episode on Catherine de Medici. She married into the House of Valois. She was from a very powerful banking family in Italy, go figure. And she was pretty open about her, you know, satanic practices. It was right after her and her children that the House of Bourbon took over the monarchy. Now, House of Valois, House of Bourbon, tomatoes, tomatoes, they're all a part of the same family. At the Palace of Tuileries, right back on the Seine River, she summoned a demon, or perhaps the devil himself. This was, of course, in the 16th century, whereas Napoleon lived in the late 18th century, early 19th century. But tales of this little red goblin devil were a abundantly spread throughout France from the time of Catherine de' Medici all the way to Emperor Napoleon I. It is said that this demon appeared to Napoleon in 1798, a year before he took down the directory. And legend states that this little goblin communicated more with Napoleon than any other monarch before him. Now again, some people might shrug their shoulders and say, oh, this is just folklore, it's just legend, it means nothing. But now in 2021, I'm not so sure anything means nothing. If this legend was going around for hundreds of years and it was known that Catherine de' Medici was into some really evil stuff and, and now we can see how this group works, Maybe there was a demon summoned in this palace. Maybe this demon was the one that was guiding all of these members in their quest for domination. After all, we know, well, we know now, since the beginning of time, this has always been a battle of good versus evil, God versus Lucifer, light versus dark. And so my hope is when we move into a new timeline, fully into the age of Aquarius, that anything, anything that resembles darkness in our government system will be eradicated. Again, we love the people of Louisiana. We love the people of France. This has nothing to do with the people, and it has everything to do with this dark cult. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that. Again, thank you so much to Lorraine for suggesting I look into that. I would love your feedback. Again, if there's anybody who knows even more about the Napoleonic Code than I could find, feel free to reach out to me so we can understand it a little bit more. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. Thank you to Josh McKay for doing that for us. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys today. I hope you're all having a wonderful day and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.